From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. Everyone listening to this podcast has been impacted by cancer. For some, it may be a friend or loved one who is afflicted. And for others, this might be intensely personal. In this Blue Sky episode, we'll discuss some of the many reasons to be optimistic about the future of cancer, how we'll detect, diagnose, and treat it in ways that today are hard to even imagine. We'll also look back at how much has been accomplished in just the past few decades. And I'm very grateful that the person leading us through this conversation will be Dr. Robert J. Seufer. Dr. Seufer is Chief of the Division of Hematologic Malignancies, Chair of the Executive Committee for Clinical Programs, Vice Chair of the Department of Medical Oncology at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and Worthington and Margaret Collette Professor of Medicine in the field of hematologic oncology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Seufer has co-authored more than 400 peer-reviewed manuscripts and numerous book chapters, review articles, editorials, and monographs. He's received several honors and awards, including the Casti Family Achievement and Mentoring Award from Dana-Farber, the Brian O'Dell Memorial Research Award from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the George Thorne Award for Outstanding Teaching at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the Claire W. and Richard P. Morse Research Award. I think you can see that we have a remarkable person as our Blue Sky guest, and I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Dr. Robert Stroyfer, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. Great to be here. So I'd like to start uh, by going back to what made you pursue a career in medicine and then ultimately focus on oncology. Well, uh, my interest in medicine goes back uh, since I was a child, actually in, in first grade, in our first grade play, I played Dr. Pill. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a little play that we had with Mother Health and Dr. Pill, and I played Dr. Pill. So the die must have been cast at that point. Truthfully, my mother, who was a wonderful, loving mother, interesting person, was a bit of a hypochondriac and uh, would bring me along to uh, lots of medical appointments. And I got to um, uh, meet lots of doctors, uh, both for family members and for myself. And I, actually, I was interested in the doctors because uh, they, uh, they connected with me even at a very young age. In, in, in addition, when oncology came into the picture was I had uh, two cousins, uh, uh, one who passed away of a, a sarcoma when she was nine years old, and another who developed Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, when he was about 17 or 18. So I was exposed to cancer at a very young age, uh, and my grandfather had actually passed away from a, a, a head and neck cancer. So I understood the the pain that the diagnosis of cancer brought not only to the patient, but actually to the family. And even though I was very young and perhaps didn't experience that pain directly, I could witness what others uh, in my family were going through. So Dr. Story, for your chief of hematological malignancies at Dana-Farber, you've been there more than 30 years, according to my research. First question is, what makes Dana-Farber so special? Well, Dana-Farber is a, is a, NCI designated cancer center. So all the uh, patients who uh, run through Dana-Farber uh, are in fact afflicted with cancer and, they're, and that leads to a commonality of purpose amongst all the people who work there. Now, Dana-Farber is not the only uh, 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 dedicated cancer center in the country. There are a number of them and a number of great institutions. But uh, at uh, DFCI, um, uh, everybody who works there uh, from the president and CEO uh, to uh, folks who are working in the cafeteria or who are uh, helping uh, the valet cars, uh, the nurses, the uh, administrative assistants, all know that they are dealing with patients who are facing a life-threatening situation and uh, who are under a lot of stress. And I think 
uh, the individuals who work there gravitate uh, towards uh, uh, an institution like that and a, and a place where all the employees are uh, really laser focused on, on the patient. It makes a huge difference. And you've, you've been there long enough. One of the things I think our audience, if you're not in the medical field, you might take for granted is just the massive rate of learning, improvement, uh, knowledge about cancer and cancer care. Can you talk a little bit about the differences of you know, what you might have studied in medical school versus what you're teaching today and how far we've come in various forms of cancer treatment? Oh, there's been a, just a, a huge a seismic uh, change over the past uh, uh, 40 years since I've been actually in medicine. I, I became a oncology fellow 37 years ago in 1986. Uh, in those days, uh, we had uh, limited tools. We had uh, what people would consider traditional chemotherapy, uh, which was quite nonspecific. Uh, killed cells, uh, chemotherapy was designed to kill cells that were dividing at essentially a faster rate than normal cells. And so it was uh, basically an attempt to outrun the cancer uh, and try to kill the cancer without killing the patient. That was really a blunt instrument. Since then, we've made enormous advances. Initially, in the field of targeted therapy, where we've been able to uh, characterize different mutations that are associated with a, a variety of different uh, diseases, and been able to develop drugs in some circumstance that target specifically those mutations, uh, hopefully uh, without causing any uh, significant side effects. So we've become much more surgical. Uh, I don't mean surgical cutting-wise, but I mean much more precise in identifying uh, what we need to treat and how to treat it. Uh, that was the revolution of the, uh, I'd say the early 2000s. In the five, 10 years later, there was another revolution. And that revolution was in immune therapy, where we recognized through a lot of work that was actually done by one of my colleagues here at uh, Dana-Farber, Gordon Freeman, as well as others, that the immune system can be turned off by uh, tumors. Tumors are pretty clever. They can mutate. Uh, they can make themselves unrecognizable to a actually functioning immune system. And in fact, can actually turn off the immune system. And by recognizing the proteins and uh, molecules that are involved in that uh, blocking function, that is blocking the activity of the immune system, the community has been able to develop drugs to basically unblock that block. Uh, and uh, reinvigorate the immune system. And that has uh, uh, been another revolution. And that's not been in one specific disease, that's been in many, many different diseases. So uh, uh, whereas uh, previously uh, we talked about targeted therapy where you'd look at one particular gene sequence and, uh, and develop a drug that would target a mutation, here uh, this is a little less specific uh, we're able to turn on the immune system that is turned off by cancer in general. That's incredible. So is that, is what you just described immunotherapy? Yes. Okay. That's what, that's, that's one type of immunotherapy. That's what we've called immunotherapy. There've been other types of immunotherapy that have been developed over the years. Uh, these include the development of monoc what are called monoclonal antibodies. Uh, these are uh, antibodies that uh, target a particular protein on the surface or in the cell of a malignant uh, tumor. Uh, so that's another form of immunotherapy. And the more most recent form of immunotherapy is, is uh, I won't say it's even more exciting, but it's, uh, it is extraordinarily exciting. It's use of cellular therapy, uh, what we'll call immune effector cells, which are cells that can be harvested from a patient's blood, manipulated so that they express a receptor that can target a tumor cell, and essentially rev up that uh, uh, rev up those cells so that they can specifically kill uh, tumor cells in a, in the body, and this has been a tremendous advance for a number of different uh, blood cancers, particularly lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, as well as acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and more recently multiple myeloma. There's a frenzy of activity to apply this type of cellular therapy. Uh, not only to those diseases, but other leukemias like acute myelogenous leukemia, and indeed to solid tumors. And there's a lot of work being done he, he, at my institution, Dana-Farber, as well as many institutions across the country and across the world 
that are focused on uh, these other malignancies. Some of us find our careers or callings later in life, while others know theirs from an early age. Dr. Seufer is clearly in the latter camp, and I loved his stories about playing Dr. Pill in the first grade play and tagging along on his mother's many trips to the doctor. He also had an early direct connection to the scourge of cancer as he lost a nine-year-old cousin to the disease. Importantly, this loss helped him think about the impacts of cancer on families and not just patients. What he says about Dana-Farber rings true to me. If you've ever been a patient or family member and spent time there, you're struck by what Dr. Seufer describes as a commonality of purpose. It's not unlike the stories you'd hear of the early days of NASA, when they say that if you ask the janitor what his or her job was, they'd respond, I'm helping put a man on the moon. And I wanted Dr. Seufer to talk about what has changed in his field since his days as a student since as lay people, we can often take this incredible progress for granted. We'll hear more about this in our next segment. You specialize in blood cancers and, and a lot, deal a lot in, in bone marrow and stem cell transplants. Could you talk about the history of that and where that was at the beginning of your career and where that may be today? Sure. Uh, bone marrow transplant actually was uh, uh, conceived of uh, many, many decades ago. Uh, and attempts were made actually as early as the 1940s to transfer blood stem cells from the bone marrow into a, a patient with a disease called aplastic anemia. Uh, that individual had no blood forming cells in their body. That was attempted in the, I think in the early 1940s, but it was really the 1950s where a, where a, a, a visionary a leader named uh, E. Donald Thomas uh, actually trained here at the Brigham where I trained uh, was chief medical resident, as, as I was chief medical resident, uh, but went off, uh, actually, believe it or not, to Cooperstown, New York, where uh, the Hall of Fame is, and actually did experiments, uh, animal experiments, where he uh, attempted to uh, transfer, uh, do these transplants of bone marrow from uh, uh, one animal to another, and they were successful. He then moved on to Seattle, uh, Fred Hutchett, what, became the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Institute, and he developed uh, really among the first uh, bone marrow transplant programs in the world. Uh, he won a, a Nobel Prize for this. What year would that be that he won the Nobel Prize, roughly? I would say about 20 years ago, but that's something I'd have to look up. No, but it's not that long ago is the, is the only point I'm trying to make. It's This is not some old technology. Uh, I uh, became a, interested in, in transplantation and blood cancers uh, when I was actually in medical school at NYU, but uh, particularly when I became a, a resident at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where uh, transplant was uh, underway for, had been probably about 10 years when I arrived. Uh, it was still in its nascent stage. And in fact, Dr. Thomas uh, came to give grand rounds at the uh, Dana-Farber and, uh, and the Brigham. At those grand rounds, he talked about uh, uh, sort of a fascinating phenomenon that, that intrigued me, that really drew me into transplant. And that was the fact that one of the complications of bone marrow transplant called graft versus host disease, where the donor cells unfortunately can attack, the donor immune system can uh, in an unregulated, unregulated way attack tissues of the patient and be very serious and potentially fatal. In, in some cases, uh, uh, that immune activation, if it can be controlled, actually helps eliminate the tumor cells. So graft-versus-host disease, which is something we, we, we try to avoid, actually can have a silver lining in, in, in small aliquots, small doses. And uh, that's called the graft-versus-leukemia effect. And we've been attempting, uh, I'd say for the past 40 years to uncouple graft versus host disease from graft versus leukemia. And that's um, a good portion of the research that I've done during my career. So when I asked you before about what makes Dana-Farber special, you talked about the people and, and treating patients. The other thing I know about you and your work is that you're a teaching hospital and all the limited knowledge I have of, of healthcare suggests that 
that is what great indicator of quality when you're when you're involved with the teaching hospital. It keeps the physician sharp. You've got great younger people coming in, and I believe you're still teaching. Can you talk about the role of medical education in your career, and maybe how it shapes your outlook in terms of hopefulness and seeing these bright young people entering the profession? Well, medical education is the cornerstone of of the future. If we don't educate our young uh, folks, uh, we're not going to have a future in medicine. Uh, they're not going to be able to uh, learn and develop their own uh, careers and, and, and help patients of the future. So um, I've always been interested in, in medical education myself. I was, as I mentioned, chief medical resident uh, at, uh, at the Brigham, uh, where I essentially supervised the residency, house officers and uh, residents and interns when I was uh, younger, and uh, have taught, uh, I guess now, probably generations of um, medical residents and uh, fellows in hematology oncology. I'm proud to say, and this is of course true of, of many other institutions, uh, so I don't want to say it's specific to Dana-Farber, but I will say that we have trained an enormous number of uh, leaders in oncology, not just in, in blood cancers and, and, and stem cell transplantation, but in all fields. And I'm surrounded by, um, and have been surrounded by a brilliant, insightful, motivated uh, uh, women and men who have uh, risen to great heights and uh, currently occupy leadership positions uh, throughout the country and, and the world. Amazing. And and you teach them, but I assume it goes both ways. They sort of keep you sharp and they're the techno savvy, you know, they have, they come to it with different skill set and backgrounds than, than you would. And I assume that teaching sort of goes both ways. Well, well, certainly I know you, you hit it on a sore point for me, techno savvy, <laughs> because I, I do need help there, but uh, I, I do rely on the kindness of strangers to uh, help me. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, that, but uh, uh, yes, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mutual process. Uh, we feed off each other. And in fact, uh, um, one of the most important things I think about our medical system and, and, and my, my own career is, is mentoring. Uh, I've had the opportunity to mentor many, many folks uh, over my career. And I was fortunate enough to be recognized at the Farber as a, as a uh, great mentor. But I myself have a mentor, uh, even at my age. Uh, and my mentor is a fellow named Jerry Ritz, who uh, runs the uh, cell manipulation uh, laboratory at, at Dana-Farber. And uh, indeed, I was in his lab uh, back in the 1980s and early 90s. And so I, I, I don't think we ever stop learning, uh, not only from younger people, but from our uh, older folks. And I think it's a, a mutual bilateral proposition. Bone marrow transplants have grown so commonplace that it's easy to forget that this practice is relatively new. I did go back and do some research, and Dr. Thomas won the Nobel Prize in 1990. For many of us, when we hear the 90s, we still think that was 20 years ago, but we're actually now 33 years removed from 1990. Still, not that long ago. And by the way, something else I looked up, in roughly that same time period from 1991 to 2019, cancer death rate in the United States fell by 32%. That's a big number. I also appreciated Dr. Seufer's comments on education. It's really great to see in teaching hospitals the exchange of ideas and techniques between generations of physicians. And for someone at Dr. Seufer's stage of career, there's great hope and optimism to be gained by spending time around young students. And by the way, we laughed at his techno-savvy comment because our first attempt at an interview was thwarted by some tech glitches. And let's just say they weren't on my end of the microphone. And if there is such a thing as a Blue Sky Podcast bingo card, in addition to Ted Turner references, young people not wanting to have kids due to climate change, or some others that frequent listeners can probably name, lifelong learning would also earn a square. And once again, something that helps keep Dr. Seufer on top of his field and with an optimistic frame of mind, is constantly learning more about his important work. Now, before we turn back to our conversation, I should describe how I first met this remarkable physician. Several years ago, my niece Annie was treated by Dr. Seufer and his amazing team for acute myeloid leukemia. Despite Annie's bravery and positive spirit and everyone's best efforts, 
which included two bone marrow transplants. Annie passed away in November of 2019 at the age of 29. Through this terribly difficult time, I was able to observe Dr. Seufer's incredible sense of caring and compassion for his patient and her family. He was there at Annie's services and remains close with her parents, my sister and brother-in-law. This despite the fact that along with Dr. Seufer's many strengths, he is unfortunately a rabid Yankees fan and our family favors the Red Sox. Because of my family's experiences with him, I really wanted to hear Dr. Seufer talk about the impact that his work has on him personally and how he handles the range of emotions he must feel every day on the job. To talk about your job and your profession in, in more personal terms, I imagine that it can run the full gamut because on the one hand, you can be Superman and save somebody who's in a terrible predicament. And then the other hand, despite all your best efforts, it doesn't work out and the patient passes away or the condition gets worse. I'm wondering how you on a personal level manage that because I've seen you in action and you, you remain incredibly personable. You're a great listener, but you're also very upbeat and optimistic generally. How how do you, is that something you think you just have innately or is that something you've had to work on and learn? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think it's a little bit of both. I don't know what having those qualities innately really means because you're probably affected so much by your experience as a young person, by your family, your friends and your experiences that you absorb what's happening around you and you have sort of a, your antenna up for uh, where a patient is or where any individual is on, on a particular subject. Um, I think it's important to know that when you're dealing with a patient who is facing a life-threatening situation, um, you can't really treat all the patients in, in an identical fashion. Patients come at this differently. They have different values. They may have different uh, goals, uh, depending on where they are in life. Uh, they have uh, certainly their faith may have an, an impact on how they view um, their illness. But at the same time, um, you, you talk about being op optimistic. I, I try to be optimistic, but you have to be realistic. You have to be realistic. And, you, and it's critical not to mislead the patient. It's, it's also important to give them a sense of what you think the odds might be to some extent. But uh, remember, if, um, uh, if somebody has a 90% chance of being cured and being well, there's still 10% of people who aren't cured or aren't well. And uh, to them, it's 100% because it's happening to them. And vice versa, if you have um, just a 10% chance of being cured, well, you could say, well, it's only 10%. So is it worth pursuing some sort of therapy if there's only a 10% chance of being cured? Well, what if you're one of those 10%? So I think that uh, it's important to be honest with the patient, uh, but you can be honest and optimistic at the same time. And are you able to compartmentalize? I mean, do you, do you drive home and, and are able to leave some of that behind and enjoy no. an evening? Yeah. So it stays with you. Uh, uh, the answer to that is no. You could ask my wife. You could ask my coworkers. <laughs> I, I wear it on my sleeve, but, you know, I have to go. First, I have to go on to the next patient, number one. So I can't walk around with a uh, uh, with a terribly down face and heart. I have to treat them with a degree of hopefulness and lightness as well. I have my family and my friends that I, I can't uh, bring that home to them all the time. Uh, but it's it is a I'd say it's a constant battle uh, to try to figure out how to compartmentalize. I think if you compartmentalize too much and you say, well, that's the way it is, then you lose a little bit of your humanity uh, and you stop treating the patient as an individual uh, and their family uh, as individuals. And you really want to make sure you're, from my perspective, that you're uh, connecting with them. So I try to feel their, well, I can't help but feel their, um, their pain when things don't go well. And uh, I, it does have a bit of an effect on me. Sure. So um, one of the things I'd love to talk to you about, another thing that makes Dana-Farber special is, um, and people get confused by this, I know I do sometimes, is the concept of a clinical trial. 
So you'll ha- you'll know someone who's dealing with a difficult challenge and they're looking for clinical trials to participate in. Can you explain what those are and what role they play in advancing medicine? Well, they are critical to moving uh, the field forward. And indeed, a, a lot of folks uh, have some misconceptions about clinical trials, but clinical trials basically are trying to test uh, new therapies uh, that have not previously been used. That's one type of clinical trial. Another is trying to compare two different therapies that might be out there to determine which is better. Both may seem okay, but one may be better than the other. Uh, Clinical trials uh, generally start when you're looking at the former situation with developing a new therapy, with trying to find out the uh, optimal dosing and schedule for a trial. Uh, These are very early stage clinical trials, so-called phase one clinical trials, uh, that um, where we're really at the very early stages of testing a drug and aren't quite sure about what the toxicities might be. And I have to say that the the patients who enter those trials, who often have uh, uh, serious uh, clinical situations, are extraordinarily brave uh, pioneers uh, because we we don't really precisely know what will happen. We have some idea. There there are often animal studies or extensive toxicity studies in other systems uh, to give us a sense of what's going to happen in a clinical trial. Uh, and what's going to happen in terms of toxicity. But we uh, don't have that much experience where we can say with great certainty what's going to happen. And, uh, these, uh, I'll call them pioneers, really do pave the way uh, for later stage trials where we can really identify uh, what drug or treatment uh, will work and how best to use it. And I can certainly say that the examples I gave earlier in our conversation about targeted therapies, uh, immune therapy, and the cellular therapies that I talked about, I'd say the three revolutions of the uh, last 20 years uh, couldn't have happened at all without a sophisticated clinical trial system where we're uh, systematically testing uh, what the uh, best dose and schedule is and and, uh, comparing it to uh, traditional therapies. Dr. Seufer describes the mindset and manner with which he approaches his patients and their families. I think he's offering us all great life advice when he says he tries to be optimistic, realistic, and honest. And seeing the person, not just the patient, or worse, the statistic, is vital, I think, to being a great doctor. I really appreciated his example of the two sides of the 90%, 10% coin, for example. And as he battles not wearing his emotions on his sleeve, he also tries hard to be careful never to lose his humanity in the process. With his discussion of clinical trials, we can see some of Dr. Seufer's ability to focus on patients as people, as he describes the ones who sign up as brave pioneers. And in my view, they're also by definition optimists who are doing a great thing, not only for themselves, but for all of us. Getting back to our conversation, when we were getting ready to start this interview, Dr. Seufer told me he was on his way to a conference in Germany later that evening. And this made me think to ask him to talk about the remarkable collaboration that happens in the field of medicine. The medical profession, I think, is interesting for folks who don't work in it in that certainly there's there's competition, if you will, in terms of, you know, you hope that someone might come to your hospital versus the other and you've got your hospital administrators have budgets to meet and that sort of thing. But at the same time, it seems to me it's very collegial. There's a lot of sharing of information. You mentioned when we were setting up off off microphone that you're headed to Germany to give a speech. Presumably you're going to be educating folks over there. Can you talk about that spirit in medicine and how much that has helped advance us as far as we've come? Uh, Yes, it's it's a a really, uh, if all the world could collaborate like, like uh, uh, we do in in science and in medicine, I think uh, the world would be a better place. We have the opportunity to uh, speak to and work with uh, folks from around the globe, uh, really almost in every country. And our main mission as physicians, 
uh, researchers, and scientists, is to develop therapies for patients who are suffering with some uh, malady, uh, in, in, our, in my case, uh, cancer. And I think our, our commonality of purpose is quite evident and really drives the field. And so we have a number of different international meetings where folks uh, travel uh, back and forth uh, around the globe uh, to, uh, to meet. Uh, of course, during COVID, we did this uh, uh, virtually, but we're back to a meeting in person. It's also a wonderful opportunity to, to uh, see how things are uh, done differently uh, in different uh, settings. In general, as I said, medicine is there's, there are many more similarities than differences, but we can learn from each other uh, in terms of our differences. There might be best practices we could pick up from each other. Are there are there places around the world that are particularly strong uh, moving ahead with cancer research, or does the United States tend to be ahead of that and and spread word from here and practice from here elsewhere? Well, I think the United States has a, a large treasure trove of researchers and a commitment from the government. Uh, to uh, support research uh, through NIH. Uh, but uh, in Europe, there are some outstanding researchers in Europe and uh, in, in Asia, Japan, China, the Middle, Middle East, Israel, and a, a number of other places around the globe. So I wouldn't say that uh, there's a, uh, a huge difference between the U.S. and, say, some other places in Europe. But the U.S. is, of course, bigger than most other countries. So there's a, a larger a nidus of researchers here probably than, than elsewhere. And sometimes you'll hear, they'll, they'll describe finding a cure for cancer. And obviously different cancers have become more curable than others. And for the lay person, I think it's hard to sort all that out. Can you, in the, in the simplest way possible for a mind like mine, <laughs> explain what makes certain cancers, why we advance so far in certain cancers and why are some others still so challenging and, and how might we get to that quote unquote cure for cancer? Well, I think uh, the first thing we need to do is recognize, uh, and you alluded to this a second ago, that cancer is not just one disease. Cancer are really uh, many, many different diseases. And with, with it, within even one type of cancer, like you know, I'll just talk about leukemia for a second, acute myelogenous leukemia, there are a number of different mutations that occur within a cell that can make it malignant and uh, cause leukemia. So it's not a one size fits all for each type of cancer or even different subsets within each type of cancer. So uh, we really, as I mentioned earlier on, looking to try to target cancers, we have to find the specific target subtype to, uh, to identify that, that, that target in a subtype of cancer and then develop uh, therapies that, uh, that will address that particular target or that particular pathway, uh, which may be different in, in different types of cancers. Now, when I, I mentioned uh, 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 as well, this uh, revolution of immunotherapy, where we've uh, sort of taken the brakes off the immune system and helped to charge up the immune system so it can I, uh, identify and kill uh, tumor cells. That actually is less targeted uh, and uh, may be uh, an equalizer in some cases amongst different cancers. One of the most important aspects of cancer research is actually not learning from necessarily patients in whom a cancer has been eradicated, but learning from patients in whom the cancer hasn't been eradicated, understanding why our therapies have failed and how the cancer cell has become resistant. So we have um, lots of efforts here and elsewhere uh, about understanding, overcoming uh, uh, resistance to our therapies. And I imagine that's a huge part of the value of collaboration, right? It's, just, it's a volume, you know, the more of these cases you can see and study, the better off we're gonna be in terms of advancing the science. Yes, I, you, know, you know, I have a, uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to have been awarded a, uh, or, or my, my, my coworkers and I uh, at, at the FCI were awarded a large grant from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society recently called a SCORE grant, S-C-O-R grant. And in that, I've been able to uh, uh, collaborate with two outstanding uh, researchers in uh, Europe, one named Luca Vago in Milan, 
and one named Robert Zeiser from Freiburg, Germany. That's where I'm going uh, uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, these collaborations across institutions are becoming more and more frequent. And uh, years ago, people would talk about working in a silo and working just at your own institution. But um, uh, through many collaborative efforts, you might have heard of Stand Up to Cancer and, and uh, other efforts like that. Those silos are being broken down so that uh, we are trying to work directly with our colleagues in conjunction with them rather than in competition. We're fortunate in the United States to have an organization like the NIH contributing so greatly to the advancement of medical research, and also to have physicians like Dr. Seufer and his colleagues around the world who collaborate to create the rapid advancements we see in fields like oncology. Getting back to our conversation, I asked Dr. Seufer to think ahead 10 years from now and tell us what kinds of advancements he's hopeful we'll have realized by the year 2033. Well, uh, I think that uh, I suspect to some extent there'll be, uh, well, one aspect certainly, I think what we've seen over the last 30 years, oh, this, this isn't true for all patients, we've been able to deliver cancer care with less toxicity. And I think we'll, we'll be more precise about the drugs we deliver. Uh, we will uh, hopefully have less off-target effects uh, and, and less... Uh, uh, collateral damage, if you want to use that term, so that patients will be able to tolerate uh, their therapy much better. In, in addition, we're going to learn uh, much more about uh, mechanisms of resistance, how to get drugs into a cell, into a specific cell, uh, without uh, impacting other cells, which I think will also uh, improve the, uh, the therapeutic ratio. And so I think that we will have uh, uh, less toxicity. I think we're going to find new targets to go after and new ways to overcome resistance. I'm hopeful that we talk about wanting to get rid of chemo, sort of what we'll call traditional chemotherapy altogether. We, we may or may not do that because in, in some cases, traditional chemotherapy is extraordinarily effective uh, and we shouldn't turn our back on that. But I think we'll be using less and less of the uh, uh, toxic chemotherapy that people usually associate with cancer treatment. And projecting even farther out, uh, you also shared before we got on, you have a 19-month-old granddaughter. In her lifetime, I know this is an unfair question, but in her lifetime, will we have a quote-unquote cure for cancer? Or, I mean, is this is this something that ultimately we can really get our arms around, do you think? Or how, how might you think about that? Well, I, I think we I think we can. I think one of the one of the things that we can focus on and and an in area that's of uh, great interest to uh, us at DFCI uh, is actually early detection of cancer and uh, and actually the pre uh, prevention of progression. Uh, I have a colleague, uh, Irene Gobriel, uh, uh, who uh, together uh, with me, or really it's her, it's her, it's her effort, uh, has started the Center for Progression Prevention of Progression at DFCI looking at patients with early stage cancers, in this case, blood cancers, uh, which we can detect uh, before a patient is symptomatic at all. And um, the question is, uh, should we intervene in those patients? Can we prevent progression to a full-blown malignancy? And uh, that's uh, certainly a tricky undertaking because we don't want to expose patients to unnecessary therapy, which could cause some sort of uh, negative consequence. But if we could catch cancer early on, we know we can treat patients much more effectively uh, when there's a, a limited burden of disease before a, a great number of mutations have occurred. So if we can intercept uh, these malignancies uh, before they really become significant and progress, then I think we'll be able to cure more and more people. So hopefully we'll be seeing, we'll be identifying patients earlier in their malignancy. Uh, and being able to more effectively eradicate that malignancy rather than waiting for it to uh, progress. Uh, but again, as I said, this is a, a, a little bit of a tricky business. We really have to balance what our interventions will be uh, with, uh, you know, the, uh, understand the cost benefit of that kind of, of, uh, of uh, undertaking. And even before the onset of disease, is there a time where we are looking at 
genomic characteristics or, you know, almost knowing from birth that not that this person will have X, Y, or Z disease, but they're more prone to it potentially. And so you're sort of on the, on the watch even sooner. Is that going to be part of the mix? Yes. Well, there's, there, there are a number of different programs around the country. My colleague, Judy Garber, uh, at uh, Dana Farber is a leader in this and her group looking at uh, what are called germline predispositions. And that basically means is that you have uh, patients, some patients have a predisposition to malignancy. Uh, these malignancies, these predispositions can occur early on in a patient uh, at childhood or teenage years, but there are some mutations that have been identified that are associated with malignancies that occur later in life, even in patients in their 50s, 60s, or 70s. So we're learning much more about that. This again, of course, has to be carefully uh, watched because, uh, and that's why there are essentially analyze every patient uh, because we might be identifying things that are never going to come out as uh, as malignancies. So uh, Dr. Garber and her colleagues have uh, very sophisticated processes around uh, these uh, testing. Usually, patients who will have a family history of malignancies uh, uh, in their immediate or extended family are offered genetic counseling and genetic testing uh, so that they can see if indeed they do have a mutation uh, that, uh, that might be helpful for not only them, but their family members to learn about. Well, it's all incredible to think about. And, and Dr. Soifer, I have a sense for how busy you are, and I am so thankful you, you took this time for us. I think a lot of people out there in the world take for granted pace of change and research and innovation. And it's done by people like you at institutions like Dana-Farber and others. And uh, it's just, it's contagious, your sense of enthusiasm for this work and uh, your intellect and all that you bring to it. And so I just want to really thank you for the time you spent with me today and uh, for all the incredible work that you do. Thanks. Thanks very much. I, I, I've been blessed to uh, be able to participate in, in uh, this uh, field and in these studies. And uh, I'm just uh, delighted that uh, I'm still able to do it <laughs> and uh, help patients. Thank you very much. Take care. All right. You too. One of the many reasons cancer can be so brutal is that the treatments are oftentimes themselves very difficult. So it's particularly encouraging to hear Dr. Soifer describe new treatments that will be more targeted and cause, as he describes it, less collateral damage. And with new technologies, including artificial intelligence, earlier detection of cancers, even before the onset of symptoms, will make a huge difference in our ability to treat them. I hope you enjoyed this Blue Sky conversation with Dr. Robert J. Soifer and that you're able to take from it some hope and optimism about the future of cancer care and in knowing there are so many remarkable people like Dr. Soifer and the entire team at Dana-Farber who are working so hard every day to bring relief to patients and their families. If you appreciate this kind of subject matter, you might want to subscribe to the Blue Sky podcast so you'll be sure you don't miss any future episodes. And while you're at it, please consider giving us a rating or review. We'd love to hear what you think. And also, you might want to follow the Optimism Institute for daily doses of hopeful and inspiring content on social media. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke. And I thank you for listening.